Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask that you take your seats that may, be, may begin our Loma Legacy Award program. As you do that, please enjoy this video introducing you to our 2023 Student Rising Alumni Award recipients. I'm Dean Nelson. I teach journalism here at Point Loma, and I met Lainey when she was an incoming freshman, and it was during the pandemic, so it was all on Zoom. She was already impressive. I could tell even then, this was somebody who's headed for greatness. Lainey is an exemplary student, but she's also just such a well-rounded human, and that plays out in the way that you see her choose activities on campus, um, from being an RA to things like being the editor of the student newspaper as a junior. Her ability to lead the students in that endeavor has been very, very impressive. The feedback she gives each student, the way she honors their ideas, they defer to her judgment and to her wisdom because students respect her. Oh my, I don't see that kind of ability come around very often. Lainey can stand shoulder to shoulder with other journalists that are in her industry. She wants to talk to people whose stories are not heard. She wants to go to people who maybe are misrepresented. The opportunity for her to listen and to care about others on the campus is evident over and over again. There's always a dimension of compassion and empathy and I see that in all that Lainey does. It's hard to believe Lainey is still only a junior because of all she's accomplished in the time that she's been here. Seeing the way her career has already blossomed while still a student, that what's next for her will just be great. And we cannot wait to see what's in store for her. It is my honor to introduce Lainey Alfaro as one of the recipients of the 2023 Rising Alumni Award. Congratulations, Lainey, we are so proud of you. Hi, I'm Lindsay Lupo. I'm a professor of political science and I have known Lydia for three years. When I first met Lydia, I think I was most struck with the way she dedicates herself to everything that she chooses to engage in. She has such a curiosity about her in terms of academics, in terms of people that she meets, in terms of looking for ways to serve the world. Lydia just approaches everything with just this attitude of how can I learn more? How can I do more? Um, it is a quality that I think is so unique Lydia really does have a servant's heart. It is truly backed by so much humility. You wouldn't necessarily know how much she's doing to serve others. I've seen this in so many different ways. Her summer that she spent back at home in Poland um, serving the refugee population on the Ukrainian border. All the while she was doing that, she was working on her senior honors project and through every step of the process, she has been engaged, she's been dedicated, she is just this sort of all-in kind of a person. She just really has a way about her that is calming to others and in a sort of sensibility that I find so admirable. I am so happy to introduce Lydia Sundberg as one of the recipients of the 2023 Rising Alumni Award. Congratulations, Lydia. We will miss you when you are gone. What an honor to have had you, and we cannot wait to see what you go and do in this world. Isn't it incredible to see the caliber of students that we have here at PLNU? Yesterday morning, we got the chance to recognize both Lainey and Lydia in front of their peers at chapel. And they are here with us again today. Would you both stand and let us congratulate you.
Congratulations to both of you. And uh, my name is Matt Robertson, and I have the pleasure of serving as a president of the Alumni Board, and also hold, I get to hold a position on the PLNU Board of Trustees. And I'm Kendall Lucas, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving, and I love homecoming. I love homecoming too. <laughs> what a great concert last night. We had the 5K this morning. Yep. Some very fun, engaging reunions have been going on. And there's just something special about so many people coming together across so many generations to connect and celebrate all that God has done and is doing here at Point Loma. Yes, I agree. Uh, this event at Homecoming is special because we get to share some incredible stories of our PLNU family and how legacy is lived out beyond the bounds of San Diego. To get us started, please help me welcome Vice President for University Advancement, Kelly Smith. I love Homecoming too. We want to welcome you to Loma Legacy Awards 2023. Um, I especially love getting to hear the unique stories. I'm sitting at the table with Kathleen Vaughn, who was an awardee in 2010, I believe. And so just getting to hear her story is lovely. That was before my time. Um, but the stories have stuck with you. And you've, as you've entered in, what you, the influence that PLNU had in your life has stuck with you as you've entered into different seasons of your lives and it's fun to get to hear those stories. Today, we have the opportunity to recognize eight incredible alumni who are making a difference in their communities and around the world. But before we do that, I'd like to take a moment and recognize those who've gone before um, and ask any of our past alumni award recipients to stand and just be recognized. We know you're out there, yes. Oh, there's a tremendous amount of, of brilliance in this room, just uh, beautiful, beautiful people. I'm grateful to have uh, you representing Point Loma Nazarene University. And I would also like to take a moment to honor the families of this year, year's awardees. Uh, many of our awardees have shared how they wouldn't be where they are without the support of their family and friends. So will the families of this year's award recipients stand so that we can recognize and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, last year we celebrated PLNU's 120 year milestone in advancement, we like to celebrate. In alumni relations, we love something to celebrate. Well, this year, we, we want to honor and remember the brave men and women who took a leap of faith and moved Pasadena College from Pasadena to San Diego 50 years ago. Please help me welcome Dr. Brower as he comes to the stage to share his reflections on the move. Thanks, Kelly. There are many days where I, I wish the memory of these times uh, were personal memories, but I was in college at um, what is called ANU, another Nazarene <laughs> University. <laughs> so as I, I was sharing with a uh, few back here, the reflections that I want to present today are in major portions collected from some of my readings, but in large part from the stories that I have gathered over the years. And as I was finishing my comments, I thought, I hope all of those stories were true <laughs> uh, because I'm going to quote them. And you can be the judge, and um, Vicki and Sandy have agreed to kind of give me thumbs up or thumbs down as I go through. But I'm pleased to present these reflections about the 50th anniversary. This summer marks that anniversary. And I'm convinced that it is the most significant transition and transformation in PLNU's history. 
that move from Pasadena to San Diego changed everything. Although the distance was a mere 120 miles or so, the move away from a location that was rooted in traditions, memories, people, and the experiences of generations made that distance infinitely further. Dr. Reuben Welch once said to me, and I heard him say it to others, something like this. You don't move a college, you blow it up and start again. And that's our history. That's really what brought us to today. I'm not sure if it was a blowing up moment or not for everyone, but looking back across the 50 years since the move, since coming to San Diego, it was absolutely a brilliant decision. For without that decision, it is most likely that this institution would not exist. As wonderful as Pasadena is in our history, the size and limitations of that campus would have made it nearly impossible to survive in this competitive context of today's higher education. The move to San Diego truly provided a future of education and ministry, of service and opportunity, of purpose and mission for what has become a university of now 4,600 students. There are many heroes and heroines in the story of the move. Unfortunately, most of them play anonymous roles in the saga of doing so much more than anyone could ever have expected or even asked. Yet in those reflections, we should be so thankful and grateful for President Dr. Shelburne Brown, who heard from God in such a powerful way that a reluctant board of trustees joined in full support of the vision of President Brown. I'm sure the seeds of discussion about the move were across many years as the realities of the Pasadena setting were faced. There were concerns in Pasadena for health as the pollution in the valley continued to mount in fact, I was in a reunion today, and one of the speakers said, I was there two semesters before I knew there were mountains back here. The valley had finally cleared. So those concerns were real. There were concerns about the difficult circumstances of the neighborhood and the locale in which the college was settled the resistance to growth and the barriers for the future. But perhaps the most significant challenge was just the idea, the uncertainty, the disruption of moving. In the midst of all of those discussions, Professor Dr. Beryl Dillman told me he was in an education meeting in San Diego just right out by the, mission, the little inlet there at Mission, um, mission Valley. A and he said he heard in that conference that the United States International University Cal Western Campus was going to come on the market and that it would be for sale. Dr. Dillman listened intently and he went back to campus and told Dr. Brown that a college was going to be sold in San Diego and perhaps he would be interested. Dr. Dillman, in that appointment, shared the idea. I don't know where that entered in Dr. Brown's thinking, but there was a seed for opportunity. Frankly, I've often wondered, what if 
Dr. Dillman had never come to San Diego for a conference. What if he hadn't heard? You know, occasionally I, I understand that some conference goers skip out of sessions. <clears throat> what if he hadn't gone to that session? What if he hadn't heard? What if Dr. Brown, upon hearing it, would simply have ignored the news, dismissed it as a crazy idea with nothing but risk and potential loss? Oh, what a difference from one who listened. When I reflect upon what Dr. Brown must have been considering, sitting still at his office desk even today, I think about what he might have been thinking. I am sure he thought we have more than 70 years here in this location. This is all we've known. Thousands of alumni identify with PC. Our history here is rich. We just built new buildings. We can stay put and play it safe. But we do have a really small campus. This is a tough neighborhood. There's no place to grow. We're, even though we're in the heart of the church and our founder, we, we have challenges. We already have a lot of debt on this campus. How could we take on more debt? Interest rates are rising. We could actually lose this campus and that campus. Nothing is going to be easy if we try this. And one of the biggest barriers, what if we fail? I'm sure he thought our enrollments, though, mostly full. We're out of space. Things will not get easier here. San Diego would be a great new opportunity for the future. And I'm convinced, and Warren probably can confirm, at some point, I believe Dr. Brown was convinced that God just might be showing a new future, a new tomorrow. Unfortunately, we'll never really know the scope and the clarity of all that prepared Dr. Brown in his vision. But what we know is that his vision was clear. It was compelling. And it, conf it was confirmed in his heart through much prayer that this was the direction God was leading. I'm convinced that if you're going to risk everything, it's essential to have a vision of the future that is confirmed by God. The direction from God to Dr. Brown was go. And the college was on its way to San Diego and the adventures of many, many lifetimes. There are some of these posters around the auditorium today, but you can see the books were boxed and the files were loaded and the new Prescott Prayer Chapel was cut up and put on flatbeds. What a gift. And there it went. Everything that could be loaded was piled into trucks, put on flatbeds, and ended up on its journey to San Diego. As I've been told, no one was really surprised that Coach Land, Dr. Land, was tasked with much of the unloading. In fact, my friends, Dr. Joe Watkins and Mendel Thompson and others that I've heard of across the years were some of the students who were encouraged by Dr. Land to participate in the unloading. <laughs> Everything had to be ready by fall semester, 1973. Many things on the campus had been damaged by disgruntled students who left the campus that was theirs. And so 
walls punched with holes and other things destroyed and so much that had to be fixed. Think of the small team from Pasadena College and its 17 acres suddenly thrust upon a 90 acre campus and the mere challenge of trying to prepare. And not all the faculty, staff, and students would make the journey. And the new beginning was simultaneously extraordinarily exciting and frightening. Those were tough days. But the early days brought those joys and struggles as then Point Loma College began to take root in San Diego. It wasn't but a few years until the tragic loss of Dr. Brown to cancer. Our beloved leader and the visionary of this generation, the visionary who brought the college to San Diego and provided opportunity, died in office. With many questions and new challenges facing Point Loma College, there was an election and Dr. Bill Draper came in the midst of all of these transitions. And yet again, in just four years, Dr. Draper died in office and left a shocked and struggling college looking for hope, renewal, and a future. I'm convinced that in the providences of God, the board elected Dr. Jim Bond, gentleman Jim. And out of times of chaos and confusion, Dr. Bond came to leadership. And the next phase of Point Loma Nazarene College began. It is the phase of reestablishment. Dr. Bond's first seven years in office were notable for building trust, renewing relationships, beginning to see enrollment growth, and laying the foundations for finally a balanced budget. The second seven years brought that balanced budget in 1992. Annual undergraduate enrollment continued to grow. The construction of Cooper Music Hall and the long, long, long-awaited student commons, Nicholson Commons, was completed as Dr. Bond was elected to the general superintendency of the Church of the Nazarene. The miracle of Dr. Brown's vision had been established and the college was entering its future. I've reflected upon two of the most significant times in our history in preparation for today of both Pasadena and now Point Loma. The first of those reflections was the time around 1910 when the conflicts and challenges within and outside of the church and the university were tearing apart Nazarene University. And Dr. Phineas Brzee, as its leader, was literally in the middle of all of that conflict. Dr. Brzee didn't know if the college would survive, and he sought a promise for, uh, from God, a promise for the future and for the university. As most of you know, in that time, Dr. Brzee found his promise from God in Isaiah 62. If you haven't seen it, come by my office in Miris and his Bible with his sweat pierced thumbprints and fingerprints lay open on Isaiah 62. Brzee was convinced that through Isaiah and God's promise that this was the news for the university in 1910. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. The Lord will take delight in you. The Lord will place watchmen on the walls for protection. And that the way, the highway before the college 
would be prepared for the people. And in that preparation, the stones and the barriers would be removed and that this would be a place, a university, where the people would be called holy people. That's Isaiah 62. In that promise, I believe God gave hope and courage to Brazil, and the university survived, and it grew, and it became a way for future generations. More than a half century later, it was Dr. Brown's turn. Dr. Brown was faced with his own crisis of the future. Something remarkable was needed. The Board of Trustees, as I'm told, didn't share his initial vision for the future and relocation. As a president, that's a tough place to be. But like Brzee, Dr. Brown sought God in prayer for the future. Perhaps, perhaps maybe, Isaiah 62 revisited Dr. Brown somewhere in those prayers. And God led Dr. Brown to know with clarity and with confidence that God's direction was to move and to have a new beginning. It was said by those in attendance at the board meeting that there was a glow to Dr. Brown's presence when he returned from his time in prayer and presented what he believed was God's moving and the recommendation to move the college to San Diego. Convinced of God's voice through Dr. Brown and the sheer presence of Dr. Brown in that meeting, the Board of Trustees endorsed the move and thus began the miracle of these past 50 years. Looking back, so much more makes sense now. But at the time of the decision and along the journey, everything, all of it, was at risk and uncertain. Today, even with the strength of PLNU, the mission and the future are always fragile. And it is vision and hope and purpose that we must renew in every generation and in every moment. As we celebrate the past 50 years, let us also receive the call to steward and care for the mission and the purpose of PLNU into the future as we build the next 50 years. Today, let us be renewed and commit our efforts to ensure PLNU becomes all that God is continuing to call us to be. Today, we give thanks for heroes and visionaries across our history. And I call us to continue to renew the faith and hope and purpose of our journey together. Thanks for listening and reflecting upon the journey that God has us on even yet today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brower. If you haven't yet had a chance, I hope you'll take a look at the posters along the back wall depicting the move from Pasadena to Point Loma. We'll also be dedicating the Summer Viewpoint magazine to telling stories of the move. So whether you have a correction to Dr. Brower's version of the story or your own stories that we haven't heard today, we encourage you to grab a card in the front lobby on your way out uh, and submit your own story so that we can share those this summer. We know that the legacy of PLNU is built on the dreamers, risk takers, and prayer warriors of the past. The Point Loma Nazarene University Alumni Spotlight Award aims to celebrate graduates who are uniquely and successfully working to make a difference in their communities in significant and creative ways and carry on that legacy today. Each of our awardees represent different industries and above and beyond that, 
they represent innovation in Christ-like servant leadership within their respective fields. While we will only be sharing briefly about their accomplishments this afternoon, we hope you will use the QR code in your programs to read further about these incredible individuals. I'm going to invite Kelly Smith and Dr. Brower to come to the front to award our Spotlight Awardees today. Our first Spotlight Award recipient today is 2018 graduate Susan Johnson. Susan has always had a passion for helping women and youth, even before she committed to fighting sex trafficking full time. After getting connected with PLNU's Center for Justice and Reconciliation, Susan ended up enrolling in PLNU's hybrid organizational management program, where she continued to build on her foundations of leadership and business development. She is now the director and co-founder of Alabaster Jar Project, a San Diego-based nonprofit organization that aims to restore, rehabilitate, and empower women who are survivors of sex trafficking with long-term housing and tangible resources. The Alabaster Jar Project is the result of Susan's personal journey to support women who've experienced trauma and the dedication of believers to support victims of trafficking in San Diego. Please join me in congratulating Susan Johnson. Up next, we have 2013 graduate Kirsten Oberoi. Early on in her life, Kirsten, like so many others, fought against following in her parents' footsteps to become a music educator. She came to Point Loma to study music composition and was able to avoid the in un inevitable until 2016 when she landed her first music education job. Today, Kirsten is the founder and artistic director of the South Shore Children's Chorus, serving over 150 singers, grades K through 12, from the greater South Shore area of Massachusetts. Regarded as a unique and creative choral artist and arts entrepreneur, she is known for her strong philosophies and teaching practices based on equity in music education. After working with a professional children's chorus and fighting the competitive and stressful nature of the group, Kirsten was determined to find a different way. She created the South Shore Children's Chorus, a no audition needed choir with the mission to embrace the fact that students have different goals and create a place to encourage kindness and inclusion. Well, Kirsten, I am sure glad, along with others in this room, that you eventually gave in to music education. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating Kirsten Oberoi. While our next awardee cannot be here in person with us today, we are happy to be sharing his story with you. When Alex Ramirez stepped onto the soccer pitch at age five for the first time, he had no idea how it would transform his life and the lives of those around him. From playing semi-professionally to starting his nonprofit organization, soccer has been the grounding force that connected Ramirez to people from all of different backgrounds. And now he participates in it with the goal of making a difference. After compl uh, completing some community college and traveling the world, Alex found his way to Point Loma after hearing about a PLNU degree completion program on his favorite local radio station. Shout out to our marketing department. <laughs> Leaving Footprints was founded in the following years, reaching his community through soccer camps and scholarship support. The organization is dedicated to empowering children through guidance, mentors, and positive influences, and is specifically targeted at helping kids who struggle financially or have disabilities. Please join me in congratulating Alex Ramirez. Our next awardee, Mia Mwosu, is the founder and artistic director of Scripps Ballet Theater and artistic director and co-owner of Scripps Performing Arts Academy, 
where she serves more than 400 families throughout San Diego County. Mia grew up at the studio herself, dancing from age eight to 15, before performing with the San Diego City Ballet. She worked at Scripps as a ballet teacher while she was a student at PLNU and became artistic director when she graduated in 2009. By 2015, she was co-owner. When COVID-19 caused disruption, Mia brought her creativity and tenacity to bear on behalf of her students. She and her partners moved 120 classes online and when they were able to return to in-person instruction, they spent a year with students working in 10 by 12 foot squares, taped off and set up in an outdoor space, complete with a professional dance flooring under a tent. Passion, determin determination, education, hard work and faith have been the fuel behind her success. Best of all, her success is a blessing and benefit to the countless dancers with whom she works. Please join me in congratulating Mia Mwosu. Our final Spotlight Award recipient, Mary, uh, Mandy Ariotto, who unfortunately is also not able to be with us today, is a 20, uh, 2000 graduate. I was going to say 2020, but that's not right. Uh, Mandy came to PLNU as a Christian ministry and Bible major, admittedly coming to PLNU to learn what to think. In the end, she learned how to think and how to lead. Today, Mandy serves as the president and CEO of MOPS, international mothers of preschoolers and is widely known for her unique takes on evangelism parenting and cultural issues through mops which mobilizes every year millions of women's women and partners with tens of thousands of churches mandy serves as the voice of one of the most influential outreach organizations in the u.s and around the world reaching moms in more than 68 countries Mandy's wit, creativity, and resilience continues to fuel the growth of MOPS around the world, and I know she is just getting started. Please join me in congratulating Mandy Ariotto and the rest of our 2023 Spotlight Award recipients. At this point in our program, we have the opportunity to recognize three individuals for their lifetime accomplishments. The Distinguished Achievement Award is the highest award presented by the university. It is given in recognition of significant and outstanding lifetime accomplishments in a profession, academically, or in service to nonprofit organizations. It recognizes individuals with a strong Christian testimony who care deeply for others and leave a lasting impact on people's lives. Our first honoree today is Stephen Reed. Please turn your attention to the screens with me as we take a look at all Stephen has accomplished. I've been given the honor of saying a few words about my friend Steve Reed. He and I graduated from Pasadena College. We were both good students, although he was magna cum laude. Our lives came together again in 1972 when Steve was my personal attorney, and then he served for 29 years as general counsel at Focus on the Family. By working together closely for so many years, we were like brothers. Steve was always very direct, very straightforward, very clear. I just can't even think of a time that Steve fell short as a general counsel here at Focus on the Family for 29 years, which probably is one of the, the core reasons we're still strong and running to the day. He's been a leader not only with his law firm, but with the church. Primarily the focus that he has spent his passionate time for is dedicated to serving church and other ministries. He always makes sure that he's doing the best work possible. 
My dad has so much integrity that he has passed on to my sister and I. You know, in legal issues, you can always have a lot of gray. And so it, it's helpful to have faith in your as your foundation. I think that was always a starting point for him, you know, what's the right thing to do. And he was able to bring to bear his faith, his integrity into that role. He never encouraged us to do anything that would uh, be in conflict with scripture. That's probably the best standard. <laughs> as a father, he's extremely supportive. He's a cheerleader of his two daughters. Family is key to him, and he set that example for us with our own families. Now that he's retired, my mom and dad split their time between Rancho Mirage and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where my dad can spend as much time as possible fishing and golfing. And it's his goal to try to get us to all golf with him as much as possible. I'm truly honored to present Stephen Reed for the 2023 Distinguished Achievement Award. He's a man who truly deserves it. This is a man of profound faith and devotion to Jesus Christ. Congratulations, Steve. Please join me in congratulating our 2023 Distinguished Achievement Award in the lay category, Stephen Reed. Good afternoon. I am overwhelmed by your kindness and the fact that you've taken the time to be here with me this afternoon. Thank you for this recognition. As I walked around the campus yesterday, I realized how lucky I am that the school had not moved from Pasadena down here while I was a student. I am convinced that if I had been here with all the water, the boats, at the beach, I would have ended up cleaning sailboats, not practicing law. <laughs> True, that's probably right. My roots at the university are deep. My earliest memory is sitting on my father's shoulders at a Halloween ba bonfire on a dirt field grandly called Wiley Field in honor of the president of Pasadena College, a field full of rocks and clods that suffice for all of the athletic activities of the college in the 50s, except for basketball, of course. As a child, my world literally revolved around Pasadena College. Even the yearly camp meeting took place on the college, camp meet, on the college campus. My parents, uncles, aunts, and nearly all of their friends were graduates of PC. The colleges influences on my life were ubiquitous. Even my wife, Doris, and my eldest daughter, Erin, are graduates of Pasadena College, well, Point Pasadena and Point Loma. I have to remember the name difference. Spring is rapidly approaching, and preparing for today, I found myself remembering water balloons shot from Klassen House in slingshots propelled by lengths of surgical hose borrowed from the chemistry lab. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Sunday afternoon study sessions at Farnsworth Park that were interrupted by naps. Acapella choir tours and men in review performances featuring Sigmund Romberg songs. Pretty great memories. It's difficult for me to put into words the all-inclusive effect that the college and the university had on, my, on me. The four years of my time at Pasadena College imprinted my life more than any other period of time. 58 years after graduation, the friends of those years are still among my best friends. And while it is certainly true 
that Pasadena College as an institution, as a thing, dramatically affected my life. It is important for me to acknowledge the influence of a few of our professors on my life and thinking. In a real sense, Dr. Paul Culbertson influenced me almost as much as my own father. His influence was not in teaching me to be a man or how to greet people or deepen my voice, but it lay in his perspectives on life, faith, and how one integrates them. Mainly, I remember Paul Culbertson for two features of his teaching. When I enrolled at Pasadena College, I was quite certain I would major in history, and I did. But as a freshman, I was also required to take his class in psychology. And by the conclusion of that class, I was entranced and decided I would take every class he taught simply because I wanted to learn whatever he was teaching. And in the end, I graduated with a double major in history and psychology. Every class began with prayer led by the professor. As a consequence, I listened to Paul Culbertson pray for four years. His prayers were deep, sincere, and engaging. In addition, he was a devotee of books and poetry. So, often a significant portion of our class time was devoted to a discussion of the latest book that he had read, The Saving Life of Christ, for example, by Major W.E.N. Thomas, or the last poem that he had read and memorized, especially the poems of Jeffrey A. Stuttart Kennedy. To this very day, I read and reread those books and poems, and I'm moved by their messages. I owe Dr. James Jackson a great debt as well. In his capacity as Dean of Students, he was the faculty advisor to the Student Body Council. I was the president in my senior year, and his guidance was invaluable. During that year, Dr. Jackson urged me to apply for a Rotary International Fellowship. I applied, was selected, and I went to England for a year. That experience, living and studying law in London for one solid year, profoundly influenced my life and professional career. Reuben Welch was the faculty sponsor of my class and chaplain. He t his teaching from John, Ephesians, and Hebrews, and his chapel preaching deeply influenced my life and commitment to Christ to this day. Extrapolating from the story of Abraham and Isaac, Reuben introduced me to the concept of faithing. And I would be remiss if I failed to note the influence and more importantly the friendship of Dr. Ray Cook, Dr. Henry Ernst, and Professor Chet Krill, all of whom influenced the way that I was growing up, and the way that I was maturing and shaping my life. Now would my life have turned out different if I had not attended PC? Who knows? One thing I can say for sure is that I would have missed knowing a large number of significant people, people who challenged my thinking and shaped who I was becoming, people I am thankful to call friends. In the end, relationships make, that one makes during college are the most important. Bricks and mortar are important, of course, and the substantive learning is essential, but in the end, people matter the most. I have been blessed beyond measure by my association with Pasadena College, Point Loma. Thank you again for this honor. Congratulations, Stephen. Now let's take a step inside the lives of global missionaries David and Sylvia Potter as we learn about their lives in the, serving in the South Pacific. I first met Sylvia and David when they were students at Point Loma College. They were students of mine in a medical surgical nursing class. 
They were good students and uh, very serious about becoming professional nurses. When the Potters went to uh, seminary, I was really thrilled because I knew whatever they did, whatever they chose, that they'd be in the service of the Lord. When David and Sylvia were called to be missionaries to Papua New Guinea, I was a part of a church that uh, really wanted to send them off well. They are truly humble in their service to others. The Potters initially came to Papua New Guinea for nursing, both of them being nurses. And as they were there, they also studied for ministry. And they just have that heart of caring for people deeply. I talked to them about the possibility of them going to a new nation and pioneering work for the church there. They excelled at that. The Potters served in Papua New Guinea from 1992 until 2003 when they were called to Vanuatu. They were called um, initially to go and uh, just, just establish a church. Additionally, they were asked by the general church to start a Bible college for uh, several island nations, including Fiji, Samoa, and Vanuatu. The Potter's character uh, runs very deep and, and they're um, selfless in whatever it is they're putting their hand, mind, and heart to. They have given their lives to spreading the gospel and serving in other countries, often at very difficult times. But they never complained, and they always trusted the Lord to lead every step through whatever they were facing. So many times in their lives they've said, I'm not qualified, but Lord, you're calling me, so I will go. That is the story of their life. That is the story of who they are. The Potters concluded their ministry in Vanuatu in 2021, and they're moving into a new phase of retiring from full-time missions. David and Sylvia have left Vanuatu people, a strong church that is ministering in the community there. I'm honored to introduce David and Sylvia Potter as one of the recipients of the Distinguished Achievement Award. I think they're very deserving of this award. We are so excited for David and Sylvia, and we'll see what the Lord has for them next because they are really servant-hearted people. I want to say a thank you. So many lives have been changed because of their ministry, the way they've exemplified just a humble servant's heart. I can think of no one more deserving. Congratulations, David and Sylvia. Please join me in congratulating our 2023 Distinguished Achievement Award recipients in the ministerial category, Reverends David and Sylvia Potter. We just had the privilege of sharing with the uh, nursing alumni, and that was exciting. I was called at, at a very early age, the age of five, uh, to be a missionary. The Lord just said, come down to the altar, and I did, and he said, will you be my missionary? And I said, I would. And, um, and of course, there was a lot more yeses after that that I had to, because he would ask me again, did you mean it? <laughs> yes, I really meant it. And... Um, uh, I want to share a story that I haven't shared with very many people. I don't think I've shared it at all with my family. But it's when I was uh, struggling over what major I should take. I was thinking of chemistry, biology, religion, or nursing. But I was thinking, a man in nursing? I mean, how will that work out? Would I even be accepted? What would people think of that? You know, I had doubts about it, and I was praying about it. I was in the Lyle Prescott uh, Prayer Chapel, and they had special booths, uh, private places where you could pray. And uh, I was praying and asking the Lord about that. And a professor's wife came in, and she was nine months pregnant, and she came right into my booth. And she said, how can I pray for you? 
God spoke to me through that. <laughs> I can't tell you how, but I knew it was nursing. <laughs> and it has opened so many doors, uh, working in pediatrics and as a public health nurse and leading the Nazarene College of Nursing. The Lord has helped in so many ways. Another thing from PLNU that has been so foundational, of course, is Dr. Reuben Welch. We really do need each other. He, he brought that home to us so many times. It, it's just part of our being. <laughs> and uh, he was a tremendous influence on us. I want to say thank you to Dr. Brower, who actually came to Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Yeah, with Dr. Margaret Stevenson and uh, Patrick Allen. And they came to help the Nazarene College of Nursing, and I shared about that with the alumni. It's kind of a long story. But uh, such humble people, so willing to cooperate. And in that case, other universities were there too, like Southern Nazarene University and Mid-America and Olivet and... I was overwhelmed. God put that together. Praise the Lord. So we give him all the glory. And also love works. And maybe Sylvia will share more about this. They, they came to Vanuatu. We didn't know what to do with them all. We didn't have any place to put them. So we just put them in our house and out on the porch and put up a shower outside for the boys. But what an impact. They impacted that nation for Christ. There's so many ways that PLNU is still uh, impacting the world and did through, through those years. Well, would you like to share, dear? <laughs> we are so humbled and uh, thankful for the opportunity to uh, give glory to God for the distinguished achievement that he's done through our lives. Um, and uh, I just feel like I need to say thank you to a lot of people. Uh, I'm really thankful for my parents, um, Jean and Donna Heasley. I grew up in a professor's home. My dad taught at Southern Nazarene University in Oklahoma. And um, our our home was a place where we read the Bible together and knelt on our knees to pray, and my parents taught me the right ways to live, and I'm really thankful for that kind of upbringing. Every day as I walked out of the house to go to grade school, my mom would call out to me and my brothers as we left the house, be good and study hard. <laughs> every single day and I did my best to do that I was a good girl and I always studied hard um, also very shy and um, didn't like to have the limelight on me um, I'm thankful thankful for my parents and I'm thankful that today I can be home in Michigan with them in their elder years, 90, 90 plus years old, and using my nursing skills to help them. I'm thankful that God brought me together with my husband. Um, if I'd stayed in Oklahoma, there was no nursing program there then, but um, I'm glad I came out here to meet David. And a few weeks into our getting to know each other, he said, I think I need to let you know that God's calling me to be a missionary. And I tell you, it's been quite an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was not scared or put off by it. It just sounded like a good idea. And eventually God also placed that call on my heart too to serve him cross-culturally. I'm thankful for um, this university. I came here and was trained well to be a nurse. I, I learned to care for the whole person, not just physical needs, but looking at them and assessing in all the dimensions that make a person. Uh, but it didn't stop just with nursing. I also 
Um, like you mentioned, we uh, learned music and music history and literature and history and theology. And wow, I became a much bigger person. Uh, and I'm thankful for that kind of background and how it's led me uh, in, the few, in, the, in my later years. I'm glad for a chance to be a mother to three sons and how they taught me to love selflessly <laughs> and are still teaching me to love beyond limits because they are a different generation that loves beautifully. I'm thankful for friends that um, I met in college and we've been friends all these years. The, the little boy that walked in our, in our wedding carrying the rings on that little pillow is here today. He's a man that serves the Lord. I'm thankful for um, yeah, colleagues around the world that God has brought me into friendship with that have made me to be who I am. Um, I recognize that I am not very strong or wise, but I'm on the journey with other people who have skills and wisdom that I don't have. And God has been with me. God has been with us. And uh, in my weakness, he has been made, he's strong and he makes himself obvious. Um, I'm thankful for partners in ministry in Vanuatu that continue. I think the biggest thing that God did in our lives was to help us to know how to serve with missionaries from Papua New Guinea. We had to speak in different languages in order to have meetings together. We saw the world differently and we had to learn to come to terms with that, how to get along. And the Lord helped us to serve together for 16 years, and we're thankful that they never gave up. They didn't give up because of us, and they didn't give up because of anything. They're still serving the Lord there today, helping that work to continue. Thank you. All the glory goes to God, and we're so thankful and full of joy at what he has done. Thank you. Will you please join me in thanking and congratulating all of our award recipients. It has been a tradition the last several years to share an arrangement of the university hymn, And Can It Be, written and performed by 2017 alumnus Sarah Giles in honor of our awardees. Following Sarah's performance, ASB Director of Spiritual Life, Judith Hernandez, will close our time together in prayer. We thank you all for being with us here today.
please pray with me. God, we thank you for this time that we gather together to celebrate the gifts and the talents in this room and the ways that each of them are living out their calling. Bless all the awardees and all of us who continue to live out our callings. May we continue to chase your calling for us. Lord, continue to send us to be your hands and feet wherever we are. Lead us to love as you have called us to love. For yours is the kingdom. Every creature, every community, yours is the power and glory. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much.